This video is all about the student-led research section. So now that you're almost done or wrapping up on your scholarly research and you have your driving question approved and uh, ready to go, it is now time to fill in the gaps by finding your own data. You are only doing one of the following four choices. You can administer a survey, conduct an interview, make an observation, or do an experiment. Go ahead and make sure you read pages 73 through 82. These pages are going to be extremely helpful. They're going to go through every single important detail about all four of your choices for your SLR. It'll even give you an example of the results at the end of various types of surveys or interviews or observations or experiments. And it'll also give you some really important tips that you need to take um, into consideration, especially if you do a survey or if you interview an expert, which are the two most popular uh, formats that um, students use for this part of the project. You and your group members must select which student-led research option you would like to pursue. It all depends on your topic and your ability or resources. For example, if your topic is too complex and it's about nuclear energy, it's probably not a good idea to do a survey of 6th through 8th graders. Also, make sure you're always thinking about how your survey, observation, experiment, or interview is relevant or is connected to your driving question. For example, if you have a driving question that is all about curing cancer through DNA technology, then it wouldn't make sense to interview someone who knows someone who has cancer. You would want to interview a scientist or someone who is studying DNA technology in curing diseases. So it's always important to ask yourself how your student-led research will further investigate your driving question. Remember, you must always get your mentor's approval before administering a survey, conducting an interview, making an observation, or doing an experiment. This is called the student-led research plan. You must show that plan to your mentor. As you create your plan, remember to figure out how you are going to do it, what you need, when it will happen, who will help you, and how it relates to your driving question. If, for example, um, when you interview an expert, it is very important that you include an adult in the conversation. We prefer that you interview someone that you already know, maybe through a family friend, maybe through a relative or an older sibling or your parents. You already know an expert in your field. Maybe it's a teacher who um, can get you connected to someone. But regardless of how you know that person, it is extremely important that either a parent, an adult sibling, or your teacher is present at the interview, whether it's over the phone or in person. Um, and if it's through email, then it's very important that your teacher is part of the email correspondence. We have some students who actually reach out to professors or strangers um, via email. So that's why it's very important that you get every single thing approved by your teacher, that your teacher looks at the email, the initial email you send to inquire if they're able to answer some questions over the phone or through email. Um, your teacher should be CC'd in that email. So I'm going to go over all of those things um, in the video. So there's also a template on how you can email those experts. So if you are doing an interview, please make sure you take into consideration those um, pieces of advice. The way that you CC your mentor teacher is that you make sure that um, where it says CC, you put in your mentor teacher's email. And then you would definitely put in the recipient's email address next to the two. So that's how you CC your mentor teacher. But before you push send, you must make sure your mentor teacher reads over the entire email and they approve of it. We do not want to just randomly send out emails to random people and not have it approved by a, an adult, by a mentor. Um, there's a certain tone and a certain way that emails should be sent. And the best way you can ensure that your email is professional and respectful is by having your teacher read it through. All right? So please make sure that your email is proofread. This is a very important uh, rule. You must follow this rule. We've had many experiences that were very positive because students followed this rule. And we've also had negative ones because students decided not to follow this rule. So once again, you must have your emails completely proofread and approved by your mentor teacher. They should be with you when you click send so that they know what you're writing and how you're writing it. 
all right? Another thing is if you're doing a survey. Now, the type of questions you ask, how you ask the questions, um, how you administer the survey, how, you, uh, how many questions you ask, the order of the questions, all of these things need to be taken into consideration, and everything needs to be done with purpose. So if you do have a survey and you think it's ready to go, you're not ready until your teacher, your mentor teacher, approves of the survey and approves of how you're going to administer it. So we do not allow you to just go out there and put your survey on people's desks or teachers boxes or uh, people in the office or just give it to anybody without giving them any information about it or even explaining what the survey is for um, you do not administer your survey that way the best way to administer your survey is by giving it to a teacher so your teacher can then give that survey to possibly another teacher that um, has students who do not have the same classes as you and that way um, another teacher could give out the survey and students can take it in about five minutes it'll be anonymous and they will not be affected by knowing that it's your survey or whose survey it is so another thing you do is you don't put your names on your survey like this survey was created by so and so and so. You also want to keep surveys anonymous uh, for the most part so that you don't have students write their names on it. Um, and you also want to make sure that teachers administer the survey for you because it's better that the survey is um, uh, given in a scholarly professional manner so that um, students will take uh, it seriously. Some of you guys may survey groups of people who are not at Mendez. You might have to survey maybe older people or maybe teenagers, maybe high school students. So you might need to have your family members, your siblings on board and help you out. I've even had students um, have to survey college students so they had their college siblings take surveys to um, school and survey other fellow college peers. So it depends depends on who you survey, uh, obviously, but it's very important that the way you administer the survey is carefully thought about. You don't just give it out to people waiting in the lunch line or sitting um, on the steps before school starts. Everything needs to be administered and data needs to be collected in um, a way that is respectful of people and that is carefully planned out. And all of these ideas need to be um, supported by your mentor teacher. It needs to be approved. So that's why on page 83 we have a SLR proposal. So this is the uh, this is where you're going to um, have your teacher approve your plan to either do an interview or a survey or an observation or an experiment. And you're going to explain um, why you decided on one of those four choices um, and how it's going to help you with your driving question. Now, if you have a driving question about nuclear weapons, then it's probably not a good idea to survey middle school students because they're not going to have a lot of information or knowledge about nuclear weapons unless they know somebody that um, is involved in that career, right? So it's very important that you think about which uh, format of your SLR is best suited for your driving question. So for that type of question, you might have to do an interview. Um, you also want to write down what you're going to do. So after you realize you want to do an interview, you have to write out your five questions um, so that you can have that approved by your mentor teacher. And remember, when we ask as experts questions, we want to make sure that we are respectful of their time, which means we do not want to ask them um, common sense questions that we can find in the dictionary. We also want to be respectful of their time by doing some background research ahead of time, maybe reading some of the articles or some of the things that they've already posted so that you don't have to have them repeat themselves from things they have already put out there online. If you're interviewing someone who is a family friend, an expert in a field that um, you get connected to through a teacher, you still need to respect their time. Make sure you're asking really good questions and make sure you're not asking too many questions. You want to just ask maybe four to five questions. Remember to always say thank you, be scholarly and respectful, and always have an older sibling, a parent, or a teacher involved in that interview. If you plan on making observations, please make sure that your observations are consistent by using a key or a system that creates objective observations. If you plan on doing an experiment, please ask for guidance from a science teacher who can help you get the materials and design the experiment. Please be sure to read page 74 through 83 to learn more about conducting an experiment or making an observation. Finally, Throughout the whole process, you should realize that there are going to be limitations and flaws within the research component. That's okay. As long as you address those limitations and know about them, you will be fine. 
This can be found on page 79 of the student handbook. The most important thing is what you should do is you should get some pens, maybe a highlighter, and read through pages 72 through 83. You need to read every single word because I could make a super long video and go through every single step of the way um, on every single page with you, but that would be a long video, right? And we know that I've already made a lot of long videos. So what I would suggest is for you to read through all the details, all right? So this is the part where you get to go uh, be hands-on. You get to find data and statistics and relevant information that will uh, fill in any gaps um, in your research that will help further or emphasize some wonderful um, new learning um, that you've gained through this experience. And um, you'll also be able to incorporate it through uh, graphs and uh, pie charts and all kinds of data tables um, when you put up all your research in your information synthesis document as you look into all of your generalizations and you really see how this conflict can lead to a resolution. Remember, you are only doing one of the options. When you get your results from your survey or your interview or your observation or your experiment, you will be including those results on the presentation board by organizing them within the generalizations under your universal theme. You can use data charts, pie charts, graphs, and other visual ways such as picto charts to show your results. If you have any questions, it's always a good idea to ask. You can always ask any of the mentors to stay after school, just look on the calendar, or you can stop by room 308 and ask Ms. Park. Thanks for working hard, Mustangs. We are about halfway through this project. We are so excited to see what you will be teaching us. Keep up the great work.